second tech talk today from Northeast Directions. We're so excited that you guys came out here. So right now, uh, Forrest and Sammy are going to give you guys two talks. Uh, they're both from Beef Scale. Forrest is the CEO and Sammy is the chief marketing over there. And so we're so excited for them to talk to you guys and excited for them to tell you this talk. So they're all Thank, thanks for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? The sound people can hear me in their thing? Okay, great. So, um, as he mentioned, my name is Forrest Yandola. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of DeepScale. And before I dig in, let me just kind of go over a couple things. So first, um, we've got two talks going on. Um, this one uh, that I'm doing on full stack deep learning that we're just starting will go to about 2.50. Uh, then we'll take a break. You feel free to keep your chairs reserved by putting whatever garbage you happen to have on, on your seat. Um, and uh, I don't want to keep people sitting still for two hours. That sounds miserable. So we'll take a break. And then Sammy will start up with, with his talk uh, called The Shallow Dive into Deep Neural Networks at, uh, at 310. So just a little background on me. Um, so I finished my bachelor's in CS uh, right here in Siebel Center in 2012. Uh, ended up going to Berkeley to do a, a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science, uh, mainly focused on deep neural networks there. And um, as I was wrapping up my PhD, I co-founded this company uh, where, where Sammy and Gunn and I work called DeepScale uh, with my former PhD advisor, Kurt Kreutzer from Berkeley. Uh, and now we, uh, we have a uh, rapidly growing team uh, doing some stuff that I'm gonna talk about uh, towards the end of the talk. But let me just dive in here. So full stack deep learning. So let's start simple. So what's the difference between a cat and a dog? Is it uh, whether they have whiskers? Is it the color of the fur? Is it how many paws they have? Is it whether they have a tail? Well, it's, it's none of those things. As a human, we, we have a pretty easy time figuring out the difference between a cat and a dog, but we have a pretty hard time writing down rules for what's the difference. So um, as a result, this problem has been pretty hard for computers to solve for quite some time. So you know, the field that works most actively on, on this type of problem is called computer vision. And computer vision research has been uh, a pretty active area for about 40 years now, a little more than that. And I would say for the first 25 years or so of computer vision, what most people were trying to do was to come up with increasingly complex rules uh, to try to you know, uh, distinguish uh, things like what's the difference between a cat and a dog. I would argue that never actually worked particularly well. Um, there was another 10 year span or so where people would kind of do a hybrid solution of um, writing a lot of rules and then kind of sprinkling in labeled data and machine learning on top of that. And that worked a bit better. But what's actually worked the best, and this is just a breakthrough that's happened in, in the last, last five to 10 years, is something called deep neural networks, which is where we um, typically have fairly unprocessed input data, like just raw images, for example, or, or, or just JPEGs. And we output um, you know, something that's been regressed or, or binned to, to match a, a labeled test set. So it's kind of a more end-to-end -end solution than what people have done before uh, with machine learning. That's what makes it deep. So just to give you a more concrete view of this, so um, this, these are some results from a, a very popular computer vision challenge competition called ImageNet. Uh, the goal is to classify not just cats and dogs, but many other things in pictures. And as you can see, so from 2010 to 2016, there's been an improvement in the quality of results uh, you know, generated by computer vision models going from about 30%, 30% of the time you get it wrong, down to just 3%. And um, you know, basically in about 2012, that's where this big jump down is from 30% error to 15% error, lower is better. Um, that's when people started uh, getting really serious about using deep neural nets for these problems. And you know, it's, it's improved even further since 2016, but when I, I stopped uh, updating this chart in 2016, um, you know, deep neural nets had gotten deeper, uh, had gotten more computationally intensive, and that's part of what we have to thank for uh, just the progress that's been made here. I would argue, just to kind of drive this point home, I would argue that with deep neural nets doing things like this, this has been probably a more productive era of computer vision than all previous work in computer vision combined. Um, so from a, a self-driving car perspective, so Chris Ermson, I think you'll know who Chris Ermson is. Not very many. Um, Chris Ermson uh, used to run what we now call Waymo at Google. Um, and he's since gone on to co-found a company called Aurora that's doing autonomous driving work uh, just down the street from our company, DeepScale. And what Chris uh, said in, in a, a high-profile news article is, you know, it used to be that, that a really smart PhD 
would, would sit down for, for, for months on end. They, they'd hand code object detectors, for example, by really thinking great thoughts about what does a cat or a dog look like, or what's the difference between a, between a semi and a pickup truck, stuff like that. But today, the, the state-of-the-art results come from gathering the right data and, and labeling it, of course, uh, feeding it to, to the right algorithms, and as soon as a day later, you, you can end up with something that works at least as well as what a PhD student would have taken six months to do in the 90s or 2000s. And um, I think this actually sells deep learning short a bit. So it's not just that it's as good as a hand-coded solution, it's often way better in terms of its quality of results. And further, the flexibility is just amazing. So you know, if you look at different categories of objects you wanna, you wanna figure out, you, know, you, wanna go, you wanna add a new one, that's a matter of the relatively unskilled labor of collecting and annotating data. It's not really as much of an algorithmic problem anymore, uh, which is an expensive thing to do. And then um, when we think about broader tasks, not just object detection, but, but segmentation, you know, uh, speech recognition, text analytics, all these things are areas now that people with this core deep neural net expertise can tackle uh, with, with a, a somewhat more modest amount of domain expertise than what would have been required before. So um, I guess that's my pep talk on deep learning. Now let's talk about wh what deep learning really is. Um, so what I think a lot of people think deep learning is, is sitting around uh, designing deep neural net structures uh, or models and coming up with, with new loss functions for deep neural nets. That's certainly, certainly an important area of research, but that's actually just a tiny little corner of this little box and this big picture. So there's actually a lot that needs to be done, a lot of different skills, a lot of different backgrounds that go into this. And um, just to briefly describe what these are, so data is, is all, all the data and annotation and storage and everything uh, to train and evaluate your model. Um, models are also quite broad. It's more than just model structure, as I'll get to in a bit. Infrastructure is every line of code that underpins the, the training or evaluation or debugging or deployment of your neural networks. And applications uh, could be just about anything. So let me just break these down a little bit. So data. So I think what most people think about data, um, maybe, maybe this audience is too smart for this, but a lot of people think, is, well, let's say you're doing self-driving car stuff. You, you just drive around and collect data, and now you have data. Isn't that, isn't that it? Um, do people have ideas of what else you might need to do besides just collect the data? Clean it, normalize it, label it. Clean it, normalize it, label it. That's pretty good. Any, anything else? Yes? Like uh, more labeling? Yeah. Uh, how about storage? Yeah. So let me, let me just show a few more of the things that I think people often forget that are just as important as the data collection piece. So um, you've got annotating the data. Um, so this, this task I have in these boxes here is called semantic segmentation. And that, the goal there is to have the model, uh, the deep neural net model, ultimately figure out what every pixel, you know, what object it's part of, what kind of object. And so making tools that make annotators, often who are, are lower you know, skilled laborers, maybe even work in developing countries, make them more productive and, and uh, so forth is a, a, a rapidly growing area of research. A task definition is another one. So there are details down to the level of, so this is a road, um, and you see these lines here, these lane markings. So in one annotation scheme, it could be that what people decide to do is to draw each lane marking. Um, it could actually be that what we want is just a, a long line with a property called dashed, that it's a dashed line. So these are the kinds of things we, we have to think about um, in task definition. Data storage, you know, once you get beyond just one data stream and you start looking at multiple cameras, uh, maybe, maybe adding time synchronized audio or LIDAR, other things, you start to quickly move beyond what off the shelf data storage formats are capable of and have to start to write your own. Uh, there's simulation, so I, I wouldn't make the argument that simulation will replace real-world data collection anytime soon, but what I do believe is that particularly for training deep neural nets, going and simulating a bunch of stuff that wouldn't be safe to do, do in the real world, like lots and lots of car accidents in a video game, is a pretty smart thing to add to your training set. And then finally, accuracy metrics. So, you know, I think the more we understand about our application and the better at math we are, the more precisely we can nail down what can we do to automatically evaluate how well is our model working. What can we do beyond just naive kind of classification accuracy, for example? And if you notice, with some of these, I've put kind of areas of expertise alongside. 
So I would argue that if you are uh, good at front end and HCI, you're, you're maybe a deep learning engineer in, in disguise, right? So you know, those data annotation tools have become a very large industry now, and I think there's a lot of work left to do. And I think that's a, a really, there's a really well-framed collection of HCI and uh, uh, sort of web front end problems in there. Uh, similarly, if you're a systems expert, if you, if you really like you know, CS241 and 233 and beyond, thinking about the data storage, uh, the software and hardware for that could be really interesting. Um, simulation, if, you're, if, you're, you know, if, you, if you want into game design, I hear that a lot of the companies who are in the self-driving space, not, not us quite yet, but a lot of them uh, are actually hiring as many game designers as they can find to work on simulation tools. Um, so basically, the thing I'm going to keep coming back to in this talk is you, you probably, if you're beyond, say, a second or third year uh, EE or ECE or CS student, you probably have a bunch of deep learning skills that you didn't even realize were deep learning skills that are a great entry point into this field. Um, so after each of these, I'll talk about something that we've done, uh, usually a small subset, but better than nothing. So uh, this is deep scale data collection car. Uh, it's a BMW 3 Series with a very expensive and also some cheaper sensors on it. Um, on the top, you've got some, some cameras and, and some LIDARs and things. This is a radar. Uh, this isn't the sensor set that we use in, in mass-produced, consumer-oriented vehicles, but this is a, you know, we, we, we build up this for, for research purposes. Um, so this is pretty fun. And it's not just, again, it's not just about collecting data. All these other five things are things that happen downstream after we collect these data, uh, these data samples, and we do that mostly in-house. OK, let's talk about models. So the kind of first thing people often conjure up when they think about neural net models is the, well, the model structure itself. You know, AlexNet or GoogleNet or SqueezeNet or ResNet or something, right? So how many layers, dimensions of layers. And don't get me wrong, that's one of my favorite problems in deep learning, and it's a really cool problem. But it's far from being the only problem in the space of models. Um, so you've got uh, what people often spend at least as much time as model structure on is how do I pre and post process the data? And I would argue that experience kind of broadly in data science staring at messy data sets is, is super applicable to, to that pre-processing and featureization box. Um, every time you want to solve a new task in deep learning, um, uh, you know, some, some problem that we haven't done before, or you want to improve upon it, uh, a really good tool to have is some understanding of how to make an objective function, how to make a loss function. That's basically how you penalize your neural net while it's training. And if you're pretty mathy, chances are you'll be able to, to, to get into that quickly. Uh, you've got new layer types. So um, how many people have used at least uh, or, or, or downloaded uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or something like that? A bunch of you. So does anyone have any guesses how many layer types are in like TensorFlow right now? I actually don't know exactly either, but I think it's probably on the order of 100. Um, now, how many pages are in your calculus textbook from 221, 31, and 41, if you, if you add them all? Probably at least 1,000, right? So actually, every single thing that's a differentiable function, which I think a lot of you probably spent three semesters studying in calculus class, could become a deep neural net layer. Um, and if you can even approximate a derivative, you can potentially make it a deep neural net layer. So I would argue that in the design of deep neural nets, and particularly their layers, we've explored some little tiny corner of the overall search space. Like in this box, like this little tiny pixel is, is explored and the rest is unexplored. Right? Um, this picture is just from something called ShuffleNet, which is a new layer type, or, or the Shuffle layer was a new layer type that was uh, invented pretty recently. That's just an example of the kind of thing you can do when you start thinking outside the box. And as I'll get to later, if you really want to be productive with new layer types, and you're a mathy, differentiable math kind of person, you probably want to team up with someone who's good at writing efficient code, because otherwise, you'll make up this new layer type, and it'll take forever to actually run. Um, quantization and compression. So once, sometimes before you've trained, but often after you've trained, what people can do to further uh, speed up or otherwise reduce the resource utilization of neural nets is to compress them. Um, sometimes by just reducing the number of bits used to store the, the parameters as well as the temporary variables in the net, sometimes even more than that. And most of the great ideas in this area actually, from my perspective, are basically 20-year-old signal processing ideas that were probably taught in a lot of the EE classes that I didn't take because I did CS that we rediscovered. Um, and then finally, on the bottom right, there's design space exploration, which is, you know, uh, each one of these other five boxes is an infinite design space. There's lots of options for things we can try. And if you combine them, it's an even bigger design space. 
Science-based exploration is how do we efficiently search for the right sort of set of choices in our neural net? So some people call this neural architecture search. I would say design-based exploration is even broader because it covers all these things. But if you're kind of a mathematical optimization person, uh, you know, if you've been looking at, at that area, um, chances are you'll be able to add some value here. So back to you know, what's something that our team did that was kind of in this area. Uh, again, this, this could take a long time, but I'll just cut it down to one fun example. Um, so I'll go back to model structure for a bit here. So how many people have heard of SqueezeNet? A few, yeah. So um, this is a neural net that we invented a couple years ago and published. Uh, this is kind of the overall design of it. It uses these layers that we came up with called fire layers. They're kind of like inception modules in the Google Net models. And it's now in uh, pretty much all the major deep neural net frameworks as part of the source code. Um, and how it got there was, was kind of you know, when people uh, saw the following. So what, uh, what can be really interesting and useful in deep neural net land is figuring out how to reduce the number of model parameters in the net. There are other problems as well. How do we reduce the compute? How do we reduce the activations? But model parameters are one of the most important things to reduce because uh, the number of parameters you have uh, corresponds to how much storage it will take on your phone. Uh, if, you, if you have the neural net embedded inside of a mobile app and you, you uh, receive an updated version of that app with a, with a new version of the model, you know, do you want that to be 500 megabytes or do you want that to be five megabytes? Or probably more like five. Um, when you train neural nets, the, the, the smaller your parameter file, the, the easier it is to, to scale the training due to less, less communication. So there's lots of reasons why you want to do this. And as of uh, late 2015, early 2016 timeframe, this is around the time I was wrapping up my PhD and starting DeepScale, um, what people have been really focusing on is taking nets like AlexNet, which back then was, was kind of the most widely used neural net for computer vision out there, and using a variety of techniques to try to reduce its, its uh, parameter file size. So um, the best of breed one at the time, and I think this is still pretty representative of, of as good as it gets from, from trying to compress AlexNet, is something called deep compression, which combines about three different techniques. So it uh, reduces the bit width from 32-bit floating point numbers down to somewhere in the 5 to 8-bit range, depending on the exact settings. Uh, stores that as a code book. And it also um, deletes a lot of the parameters that are near zero. And then finally, it uses Huffman encoding to further compress things a little bit more. So doing all that to AlexNet gets you a 35 times smaller version of the model that has the same accuracy, which I was impressed by when I first saw this. But that squeeze nut thing I just showed you uh, does this. So it's the same storage format as AlexNet. So it's just 32-bit floating point numbers, no compression applied. And by just making an entirely new model, it's 50 times smaller. So this is something that I think has since kind of created a whole new sub-community in the computer vision research field, where now there are lots of people trying to figure out how to make smaller neural networks. Um, and I actually teamed up with the authors of the, the deep compression paper to apply deep compression to SqueezeNet, and we were able to shave off another factor of 10. So we got a 500 times smaller model than AlexNet uh, with the same accuracy. Um, so this, uh, this is just one of many papers we, we've published. Uh, we, we have ones with even better results since, but it seems like every time uh, you know, people in, invite me to give one of these talks at computer vision conferences, they actually want me to like, wheel out this results table, because uh, it's kind of fun. So. Um, that those are some, some fun things in model design. How about infrastructure? So, um, you know, a good chunk of you raised your hand when I asked who has tried uh, out one of the deep neural net frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch or other common ones would be Cafe2 and MXNet. A lot of people know about that. Um, I think the reason that this is such a, a well, widely discussed area of deep neural net infrastructure isn't because it's inherently the most important area, it's because it's the first thing that people touch when they're using deep learning, and it's something that's easy for kind of, you know, reporters and journalists to wrap their head around what it is. But there's actually a lot of stuff that fits above and below this part of the deep learning infrastructure stack. So above, you have things like visualization and diagnostics tools. So on the top left, that's kind of an impressionistic example of, of a, a loss plot, so watching your models converge. You can imagine if you have a whole team of people working on this or you're training a lot of models or both, you want kind of a whole dashboard of those to watch how things are training. Uh, in the top middle, that's an example of kind of what, you know, you want to see what's going on inside your neural net. You can actually visualize the contents of the filters. Uh, you can also visualize things like what's the, what's the input that would make a filter give the highest response, these kinds of things. And then you want to visualize naturally the, the output of the neural net. Um, you know, that, for example, on the top right, you've got object detection 
results that you can visualize. And I would argue that doing those three things and other things in the visualization and neural net diagnostics field are basically HCI problems. Like there's a ton of data to look at and you've got to sort of reduce that down to something that a deep neural net engineer doing this other stuff can actually understand easily. Uh, there's a lot underneath the framework too. So these frameworks are in some sense, uh, they have a lot of code in them, but they're also kind of wrappers around these lower, level, lower levels of abstraction. So if you want to train your nets as fast as possible, chances are you have to start scaling beyond just one compute server. Um, and you want to train potentially even on a large cluster or a supercomputer. And to do that, you really need high performance computing expertise. So if you've been working on that, this is like a natural area to work, to work in. Um, uh, in fact, one of, my, one of my friends from when I was an undergrad here, Nikolai uh, Dryden, uh, went into HPC, high performance computing, uh, did a, you know, is almost done with his PhD here. And what he ended up focusing on you know, for his dissertation is um, high performance computing aspects of like paralyzing deep learning. So this is like a super natural thing to go into if you're already like into performance programming, supercomputing and that stuff. Then the right side, you know, there are a bunch of problems that kind of reduce down to who can make the best compiler. So you know, how do we go from, you know, rather than kind of unoptimized Python code, how do we get super optimized like C++ uh, vectorized uh, OpenCL slash CUDA and, uh, and even assembly level code. Um, you know, there are a lot of different platforms to write that for and it's hard to write it all manually. It might take kind of infinite time. So coming up with efficient compiler techniques is pretty important here. So if you're already like, if you took the compiler class and you like it or, or you're doing research with the compiler research group, like that's a pretty, uh, pretty easy place you can hop into deep learning land. And let me just show you one fun example of something that, that our team has done on the infrastructure side. This is going to be kind of the bottom left of the distributed uh, training stuff. So this dates back to uh, the very, very early days, slightly before starting DeepScale when I was a grad student. And I was getting really frustrated with how long it was taking to train my neural nets, even after optimizing the crap out of them on like a single box of GPUs. And I started looking around at like the other research on this topic. And there were some pretty widely cited papers from like Jeff Dean's team at Google, for example, that I think people kind of, because it was Jeff Dean, assumed were kind of the best you could do. And the way those worked mainly were using something called a central parameter server. So that's where, so these little dots here, the, the bottom six ones represent individual workers that get some chunk of a deep neural net and or deep data. Um, and then the top is a, a central server, or it could be a small bank of servers that all receive the gradient updates, you know, the, the, the deltas basically from this iteration of training to the next, and then send back, you know, what's the, what's the, final, what's the final answer for this iteration. And the problem is, you know, if you, how many people have taken like networking or at least like 241? Okay, so like a few. So like, think about how a network card works. So if you and I each have a network card, and I wanna send you a big file, like a pile of updates for my neural net parameters, I can completely saturate your network card just talking peer to peer. So if everyone else in the room is waiting to talk to you, that's gonna be a long time before you get to everyone. That's kinda of how the central parameter server works and that's kinda of why it doesn't work as well as it, it, it doesn't actually work particularly well. So that, that central server becomes like a giant bottleneck basically. So what we figured out is, you know, you could have a more um, distributed scheme in terms of everybody does both. So in this scheme, in this Fire Cafe paper that we published, we, we do, for example, what's called a reduction tree, where pretty much every server both like does, makes progress on training the neural net and also aggregates data from two other servers. So like, you know, you, you replace this bottleneck thing with kind of a tree that's more distributed. And the general principle there, um, if you're picking like, I think it's CS420, uh, I think it's still here, Padua's uh, parallel programming class. Like that's like a whole area of study in, in high performance computing about like how to do these aggregate data updates. Um, typically it's called an MPI all reduce. So um, you can do that with a ring, you can do that with a butterfly or, or this reduction tree thing. But basically it turns out it's a lot more efficient than a central parameter server for what we were doing. And we actually got the neural nets to train 150 times faster by going up to 256 GPUs with that approach. So that saved us a lot of time overall. Um, just, just a quick note, we, we also do a lot of, you know, go back to this slide on the bottom right, efficient computational kernels and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we, we end up building the kernels ourselves too. So this is a paper we published called Boda, um, which is an open source uh, sort of kernel compiler, I guess I'd call it, for generating very efficient computations uh, of neural nets on basically the kind of processors you have in your cell phone in your pocket. 
This is kind of version one of it. Uh, Sammy actually uh, is highly involved in version two, which we call uh, Deep Scale Virtual Machine, or DSVM. And then finally, applications. So from my perspective, there are broadly two kinds of deep learning applications. I think very broad. So you've got data center stuff, right? This is you know, just kind of these little computers in the data center all kind of sitting there alone, but like hermits. Uh, sometimes it has to run real time, but often it doesn't. So in social media analysis, web indexing, government intelligence, these are all areas where there's a lot of backlog work that really doesn't really need to run real time. Um, also, there's not really a safety critical component to most of it, at least not in like the physical, it will crush you if it screws up sense. Um, so this is an area where, you know, due to having very large power budgets, uh, due to a lot of it not being real time, um, you know, we're at a point already where to have a high quality image search engine, you pretty much have to already be using deep learning on the images. So I would say this area, it's not entirely mined out, but it's, it's pretty mature. I think the green field area of these two is the edge. People know what I mean by edge computing? So like, if you have the server, that's like kind of like the, the center of the universe, you know, server farm, and then the edge of the universe is little tiny devices uh, you know, at the large, large scale one would be your laptop and a small scale one would be like a microcontroller in your, in your uh, smart fridge or something. So at the edge, I would say, you know, things like smartphones, self-driving cars, household robots, other, other robots, and, and so on. The thing they have in common is they don't have a plug into the wall to get power. They're usually on some sort of limited power budget that's kind of like battery constrained. Um, they, uh, with the exception of smartphones, could potentially uh, injure or kill you, depending on what kind you have, if they misinterpret the world or if their refresh rate of understanding the world is too slow. Um, so you know, the stakes are a lot higher at the edge in terms of you know, the, the potential downside, but the upside is you don't have to talk to the server all the time and wait around for it to respond, which opens up all these new applications. So at DeepScale, our favorite edge computing application, and actually our overall favorite application that we're spending most of our time on, is understanding the world around the car from the perspective of an autonomous or highly automated vehicle. So you know, we figure out where you can drive on the road, where the cars are, where they're going, and, and lots more. Um, and it turns out, you know, for all the reasons we talked about at the beginning of the talk, uh, whether you're using just cameras or cameras and LiDAR or whatever, um, you know, it's not just about the sensor set, it's about the algorithms, and the best algorithms for this are almost always deep neural networks. And as a result, if you open the trunk of most prototype self-driving cars that you'll find in Silicon Valley uh, or elsewhere, it looks kind of like this. Um, so on the right there, this is a eight GPU server that, that eats two and a half kilowatts of power at any given time. That's more power than my house uses unless my dishwasher and dryer are both cranked up to full blast at the same time, even though that's probably close. Um, and that's not just when I'm washing clothes, that's like all the time. And you know, uh, uh, you know, vehicles drive a lot. So you know, this has a lot of downsides. Um, so you know, or I should be clear, the reason that server's there is almost entirely because of deep neural networks. Um, to get real-time throughput on you know, eight cameras and a couple of LIDARs, a typical sensor set and a self-driving car prototype, you really do, if you use kind of the neural nets you'd find on a grad student's website, need to use on the order of eight GPUs. Um, and so here are, the, here are the problems with that. One, there's nowhere to put my luggage. Uh, two, those GPUs aren't really automotive grade parts in this case. They weren't designed to last for 20 years the way most automotive parts are, are designed. Uh, they're, they're more designed to be swapped out frequently as the next version comes along in a data center. Um, another problem is uh, the heat that comes off of that. So you have to crank the air conditioning up to full blast to, to not boil in there. Um, then you've got range. So we're, we're seem to be heading fairly quickly at this point towards electric vehicles. And if you have that much computation in the trunk, depending on what kind of electric vehicle you have, you could easily reduce your range of, that you could drive by, by as much as 30%. And automakers squabble over and work very hard to increase you know, range by an individual miles. So 30% you know, on a 200 mile range car is just an astonishing uh, drop for them. So for all these reasons, I don't think this is how we're going to do it in the future. And I think at deep scale, we probably made more progress than just by anybody else at solving this problem of getting rid of the server in the trunk for various types of automated vehicles. And um, so basically, we go from this to something like that.
And, and we really can do a lot of what fits in here on things like this less than $100 processor that's very similar to what you'd find in a smartphone. Um, so we, we routinely get you know, on, on as much as you know, 400 times, not 400%, 400 times. That's like 40,000%-ish, right? Reduction in uh, uh, how much computation we need to get the job done. And this isn't by making some fancy chip. I think fancy chips will help further with this problem. This is by looking at the neural net, doing, doing some thinking about it, using our experiences, doing some full stack stuff, um, doing some automated search for neural net designs, and this is what comes out at the end of, of our team's efforts. So um, just to, to kind of summarize the end of, of what I'm going to call part one, um, this kind of deep scale today. Uh, this isn't quite 27 people, the little picture's a little out of date, but we have about 27 people. We've raised about $18 million, exactly $18 million from, from some of the top VCs in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're based in Mountain View. Um, and as certain other stage performers like to say, I have just one more thing. Um, that's all cool and everything, but like, where do I start is, is probably a pretty popular question. I mean, how many people are wondering how to start? Yeah, like everyone. Cool, I, I picked the right one more thing. Um, so how do I start on the path to becoming a full stack deep learning engineer? So there's some low hanging fruit, um, first of all. So I think uh, UIUC is, is probably, you know, I, I haven't counted exactly, but has on the order of the same number of deep learning classes as Berkeley and Stanford do. Uh, I don't think they would all fit on one slide anymore, especially if you like look at multiple semesters and what permutations these are offered. But just three that are going on right now that my, my friend who I went to undergrad with here, is now a grad student here, uh, Rick Barber, helped me put together, are uh, Svetlana's class called Intro to Deep Learning. The prereqs are, are pretty basic. You can definitely take this as an undergrad. Uh, and then two grad level classes, uh, statistical reinforcement learning and adversarial machine learning, uh, both of which I, I don't know that they would kick you out if you were to crash it. And, uh, and the slides are, are online. I, I've read some of them. They're pretty good. Um, so there's a lot like just under this roof that you can dive into. Um, probably, and you probably already have more of the skills to get started than you think. Um, but let me, let me take another tactic beyond this. So um, I think the way to get into this isn't by trying to memorize or, or kind of become super proficient in every single area of every single level of the stack, deep neural nets. It's more about finding a problem that interests you that maybe matches some of the skills that you have that weren't even necessarily deep learning centric skills you thought and trying to solve that. So focus on what you already know. So um, go somewhere deep in the depths of one of these areas and try to do something. So you know, on the, the data side, maybe you go collect a bunch of pictures or audio samples uh, for some problem you're interested in, label them and train an existing model on it using existing infrastructure. And maybe you want to make an app where most of the stuff is off the shelf and you tweak a few things. These are all good entry points. Naturally, um, once you do that, you're, you're better prepared to mature beyond that. So then you start becoming more full stack, right? Once you're comfortable in one of these areas and you've done something cool with deep learning, that's when you start challenging yourself to learn new skills that weren't in your classes that, that you didn't do before just for fun. And I think there are ways in which you can start, if you, if you deliberately think about this, and, and set an intention to, to get deeper into deep learning if that's what you want to do, uh, which almost everyone raised their hand about. Um, start choosing internships and jobs, not just where it's about deep learning, but where you can, you can talk to the people there beforehand and figure out, yeah, these people actually know more about some aspect of deep learning than I do, and I'm going to learn from them. See, I, I have some, some friends who have made the mistake of going, oh, wow, um, this job at such and such company that's not really a tech company uh, is going to be very, you know, they, they said I'm going to do deep learning, and they get there and they're like, they thought I was going to figure out deep learning for them, right? So you want mentors, peers around you who have complementary skills in deep learning. That, that's very important. Um, and then let me just give you a little bit of a view, uh, you know, at, at deep scale about how we think about this. So from my perspective, very, very broadly, you can, you know, one way to partition engineers into two categories are the experts, the generalists. So the experts, this is supposed to be a PhD thesis. Um, it's a little bit vague, but you know, this, this little diploma. Uh, I guess they're just online now. I mean, does anybody actually have the paper copy? But, uh, and, and so this is basically someone with a PhD or lots of industrial experience, someone who's really dug in and, and done something significant and can teach as well as do. Generalists, I use a, a jack, like jack of all trades. Um, and this is, this is basically someone 
who has some relevant skills, is very intelligent, uh, and, and has done, you know, a, a, you know, has proven themselves in software engineering or perhaps mathematics. And, um, you know, I think, let's, so how many people know what tired, wired, inspired is? No? All right, this will be your first, this is, this is, a, this is like become a meme in Silicon Valley in the last few months. I don't know, this is your first introduction to it, I guess. So what's tired, I think, is just giving the hardest problems to the senior experts and then letting the generalists kind of just rot in a ditch somewhere doing grunt work. That's actually still pretty common, I think. Uh, you know, there are companies with a class system where if you didn't do a PhD, you're never going to get to be the expert. Um, I think what's wired is uh, experts, having experts spend a lot less time just manually writing code by themselves and spend a lot more time coaching others through tough problems. So have the, the experts always have their little uh, group of generalists around them who, who they're coaching through problems that are a little too, a little bit above that generalist comfort zone. Um, and then finally, one thing we've done, and we, I think, shamelessly stole this idea from Facebook, which has something called Facebook University, is we're just ramping up on, on what we call Deep Scale University, uh, where experts teach generalists in the classroom. So we have our first class running at Deep Scale. When I say I teach a class at Deep Scale, they're like, at what school? I'm like, Deep Scale University. <laughs> so, so it's called DL 401, Topics in Full Stack Deep Learning. And we, we alternate between uh, working through uh, current work that we're doing internally, basically presenting what we've done now and kind of picking it apart. That's on certain weeks. And we alternate that with going over recent papers from, from the published literature externally and trying to digest what, what were the insights that they found. Um, sometimes we even pick through the, the code that, that came from those papers and, and so on. Um, that, that's, a, that's a sort of a... Um, class organization that I, I shamelessly stole from, from one of my favorite classes at Berkeley on, on deep learning. Um, so what this adds up to is, I mean, most of you are, are any grad students in here? Two or three. So maybe you're already closer to the expert level or getting there. Most folks in here probably are starting as the jack of all trades, the journalist, right? And so like, you know, just pick one of these cards and picture it as, as you, right? Um, and you, you've got these, these great uh, expert mentors. You know, in, in this picture, it shows you working with one, but you're probably working with a bunch of them at any given time. And uh, the compound interest on this looks like this, right? And, and I got lazy on, on drawing animations and I ran out of space, but uh, you know, doing more of these. But basically, this goes on uh, kind of recursively, endlessly, right? So this is a very good branching factor where uh, you know, experts train generalists to be experts, who train generalists to be experts, who so on. Um, and, I found one of the biggest surprises in, in doing this at deep scale and watching how people have matured is it's been, you know, to get a PhD takes like five-ish years, right? Sometimes more. Um, and so the thing that astonished me was when I was sitting around, you know, a year after hiring a bunch of these generalists and they're like advancing state-of-the-art research results. And if I, I didn't see the name on, on the internal technical report, I would just assume this was done by, by someone with a PhD. So I, you know, th this has yielded, I think, very impressive results. And I guess the, the hint hint is, you know, you could be that impressive result uh, on, on such a team as well. Uh, so I am basically at the end of my time. So um, I would like to wrap up. So uh, basically, you can forget everything else I said, but try to remember these things. So full stack deep learning engineering is about more than just the narrow problem of crafting models and designing loss functions. It's a very broad, multidisciplinary field. There are lots of ways to get into deep learning and, and becoming an expert in some deep learning field and ultimately potentially kind of becoming that super valuable full stack deep learning engineer. Um, and then, you know, basically, maybe that sounds intimidating, but you probably already have a bunch of skills that can be applied to deep learning, like parallel computing or statistics or data cleansing or data visualization that you didn't even realize were relevant to deep learning. So I will leave it there. Um, I will take a few questions and then we'll take a break during which feel free to like tackle me at the front and then. We'll, after the break, we'll switch to Sammy. So, thank you. I see a question there. At what point during your climate course did you realize you wanted to be part of this? Good question. So, um, yeah, so the question is uh, when during my time at Berkeley did I decide to start Deep Scale? Uh, I gave a talk on this in the spring here, which I'm not expecting everyone to remember, but I didn't want to like redo it if it was all the same people, right? Um, anyway, the short answer is I've always been pretty entrepreneurial. Um, I, I somewhat picked my research field as a grad student based on what I thought might be useful for practical problems. Um, and I saw kind of a whole 
frontier of applications for deep learning and particularly computer vision that, that were kind of, if we could get just a little bit better results, we would be able to do all kinds of great things. So um, I think it was around my, kind of like the, the beginning of my third year of grad school when you know, my advisor, Kurt, and I really got serious. Like, and really, we were, by then we were really sure we were gonna start something together and the question was just what? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that particular example is is a, a cell phone processor. Sammy, is that one? Is that the Huawei or Qualcomm one? It's the uh, high key 960. Yeah, it's high key nine. I guess we now use 970 or 80. But yeah, yeah. Um. Yes. Sure. So, got it. So I think the question is, like, are we just going to be weirdos forever, and you know, who do this like ex expert coaching generalist thing, or is that just like going to be the new norm? And I think the implicit question is like, what does that mean about the relative importance of having a PhD or not to go into this field? Is that right? Yeah. Cool. So um, I guess the first question, you know, are we just weirdos, or is everyone going to do this eventually? Um, I think big companies, you know, Facebook has pockets, and, and Google has pockets where they they do. Uh, hire people and then train them up in deep learning. Although I think when you join those companies, there's no guarantee what your project will necessarily be. Um, Facebook AI research, which I think is, is where some of the most interesting results from Facebook come out of, uh, is a bit less, I think, upward mobility focused. Like there's, last I heard, they were on the order of 50% of Facebook AI research people had PhDs and were research scientists or, or research managers. And the other 50% or so uh, we're straight out of a bachelor's or maybe master's program, and they're research engineers, uh, which is like co Silicon Valley, well, Facebook code for like research grunts. Um, and there isn't a lot of upward mobility there in Facebook research. So it depends what pocket of Facebook you're looking at. Um, I think our perspective is we're doing something that's more like Facebook research than regular Facebook, and we're getting people who are early in, earlier in their career and giving them more responsibility than Facebook research would. Um, so that's, that's like a deep tactical answer. Um, it's hard to predict how that will evolve. I think it's startups will probably continue to be pretty unique. So um, uh, one of my friends, Rick Barber, who helped me prepare that list of, of classes to take here on deep learning, um, has this, he spent some time in Silicon Valley, uh, just spent some time in Silicon Valley. He was one of the C-level executives of the Silicon Valley startup. And one of his perspectives is a lot of startups can't quite uh, afford that trade-off of like this year, we, you know, the fear is this year we might be a little less productive than we could be if we have experts coaching generalists rather than just hiring experts. Um, and so I think if you're playing a very short game, which I think some startups make the mistake of doing, you know, it could continue to be the case that like, deep scale is that one weird oddball startup where you go and actually learn deep learning and all the other startups have experts do expert stuff and generalists do noob stuff. Good question. So what do we really mean by reducing computations? And you also have a question about are we re removing data? So first of all, reducing computations, yeah, we have kind of a broad playbook to use. So one of the great things about uh, my cursor back here, um, one of the great things about having a group of people at our company who span this whole stack is we're not in any kind of single box prison here we're able to, to kind of jointly optimize these, for example. So, uh, you know, as you're kind of implying, yeah, we can cut the computation here dramatically and we can make the remaining computations run faster. That's something we do all the time. Um, are we throwing data away? So, um, no. So the first layer of the neural net that ingests data isn't getting, it's not like that's the thing that we're making way smaller. Uh, and it's not like we're wildly downsampling the pictures or, or the LIDAR scans, it's that, the subsequent layers become more lightweight than they were before using our techniques. Are there more questions? 
It looks like people are happy. Okay, great. So why don't we take a 15 minute break or so until 3.10. Um, do whatever you have to to keep your seats. Uh, it looks like it's not completely flooded in here, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thanks. That one's the house, you probably turn that one on last. Hi. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Uh, so we're uh, about to start the second presentation. Uh, so hopefully everyone's ready. Cool. So my talk is uh, a shallow dive into training deep neural networks. And what this covers is uh, something a little bit more on the technical side about uh, given the fact you know how these neural networks now, uh, how do you actually train one to do what you need? So we kind of go into uh, the different aspects of it. So before that, um, let's see, about me. Uh, I graduated from Berkeley studying uh, electrical engineering and computer sciences. Uh, my background was in high performance computing, or like supercomputing, as well as deep learning and AI. Uh, before this, I worked at Apple doing ML, and uh, as well as Two Sigma doing high frequency trading. Uh, and currently, I'm the chief architect at DeepScale. So, um, we can talk about DeepScale a bit. So, we actually build uh, perception systems for autonomous vehicles. Um, within that, we actually work on uh, perception for mass produced vehicles, so it's something you would actually drive to work or to school. Uh, that's our main focus. We work with a, uh, a number of OEMs, or people who make cars, as well as people who supply them. Uh, we have a lot of work that's open source. If you've heard of SqueezeNet or um, other projects that we have, you can actually download it, play with it, do whatever you like. Uh, we have a website called DeepSkill.ai, and we're hiring. So if you're interested, please go to our website. Cool. So, and then here's some cool photos. That's like our car, those are some of our people, and then that's like a picture of a point cloud from our car. So here's the overview of the talk. The first thing we're gonna cover is feature engineering versus uh, learned features. So feature engineering is kind of like how Forrest said the former state of the art where you would have uh, experts actually hand code features. And as he said, it takes an expert PhD six months in a cube to actually produce one of these detectors of some sort. Uh, versus learned features, which is more of like machine learning and deep learning. Uh, we're going to review uh, neural networks. We're going to go over loss functions and objective functions, go over gradients, optimization techniques, data sets, and then finally overfitting and underfitting. So let's go into feature engineering versus learned features. So as you see here, this is a face. And we've wanted to build a face detector. In the prior art, what we have done is actually build um, feature detectors for each portion of the face. So you might have someone who builds an eye detector, an eyebrow detector, a nose detector, mouth, lips, forehead, T-zone, all of that. Um, so what you would actually have to do is like have someone who's very good at coding, very good at computer vision, actually learn a lot of this about a face. So once you have that, you would have an ensemble of features and actually put it together and make a face detector. Right? Um, so this is very time consuming. Think about if you're like a you know, software engineer, or computer vision engineer, sitting down and learning everything you can about how eyes look like. And not just eyes, but the eyes of all races, of all people, different lighting conditions. It's actually quite hard. Uh, you need to have really good programming skills, uh, have to know the expertise of the domain, as well as know uh, everything you have to about the thing. So if you're building a face detector versus like a dog detector versus a road lane detector, you have to learn a lot about the structure of it. 
uh, it's hard to generalize to all cases. So for example, uh, what happens if the person is not looking straight into the camera? They're looking off a little bit. What if the lighting is a little bit off? What if you're in a different place, like in, you know, you're indoors versus outdoors? It can make it very, very brittle. Um, and what you can actually do instead is that there's been a lot of work in actually generalizing computer vision features. Uh, so you don't have to actually do this uh, for making a face, lanes, a uh, dog. You can actually use stuff like hog or sift, which are generalized features for computer vision but they don't work as quite well as if you just hand code your features for whatever case you have. So now let's go into more about learned features. So here's a paper called uh, DeepFace, which was made by Facebook in for 2014. And what they show here is actually given a image of a face, they can actually learn the features to recognize who it was. So what you actually see here is first you have the face, the image, and then as the network goes deeper, you actually have deeper and deeper features. So in this scary looking red face here, and this one right here, you can actually still recognize the face because it's very shallow features. It's detecting things like edges, uh, texture. But as you go deeper, it becomes more and more abstract and more into a domain that we don't quite understand. So that's kind of one of the key points of deep learning, which is um, the features as we go deeper into the network are stuff that don't quite comprehend by humans, and that's okay. Right? Because the thing about feature engineering is we're trying to stick in things we understand, we know. But when you kind of let that go, then the network can actually optimize for a, a lot better than if you hand, like hand wrote it. Okay. So learning features actually can work really well. Uh, Forrest had a slide on this, but I'll reiterate. Uh, for image classification, the year before deep learning became prevalent in this ImageNet class, the, uh, the lowest error that there was for this top five uh, accuracy was 26.2, and this was using these generalized SIFT features, uh, versus now the state of the art is somewhere around 5%. This, it changes every like three to four months, so it might be better now. But at the current state of the art is something called DenseNet, um, and it's quite interesting. And uh, to perform these learned features, what you need is a lot of data, uh, deep learning expertise, and uh, a lot of computation power, unless you're us, of course. <laughs> um, so essentially, training the network is just learning the features for every layer um, over iterations of the data. That's essentially what it is. And, um, but there are some downsides. Like one of the downsides of deep learning is validation. Um, in the end of the day, it's actually really hard to validate if a deep learning network is doing what it's supposed to do, besides in just putting in data that you didn't train on and seeing what happens. So there's a lot of research on this. It's quite interesting, and I'm really excited to see how it turns out in the next couple of years. So the next thing we're going to do is just do a quick review of neural networks. So my personal view is uh, neural networks are function approximators. Uh, if you think about any function that you've learned in like, you know, elementary school or middle school about what functions are, there's something that have some input, and for every input, they have an output. Right? Neural nets are the same way. You take in some input domain, which is x, and you output some output domain, which is y. Um, but what we actually do is we get uh, this function f and actually learn the parameters of this function, which we, call, we set with uh, weights of w. So we have f sub w. Um, and there's actually a key point here which makes neural, network, neural networks work, which is we have to make them nonlinear functions. So the thing is, if I'm trying to do some kind of like linear regression where I have like a bunch of dots on a plot and I'm trying to just fit a line, that's a linear function. But what happens when we wanted to do something that's not linear? Like for example, predicting if an image is a dog or a cat. That's a very nonlinear function. You can't draw a singular line that, um, or even like a polynomial that can make that work. That's really hard. So what we have to do is we have to use this idea of nonlinearities. Um, so by introducing nonlinearities, we can actually have piecewise functions within our network, we can actually learn different representations that are not exactly linear or even continuous. Um, and yeah, so here's some examples. There's a sigmoid, which is commonly used for like an output of a network, like predicting like a probability value. You have a hyperbolic tangent, and then you have a ROU, which is the most commonly used one right now. All right, before we move forward, is there any, any questions? Yeah. So there's differentiable and then there's continuous. 
So the thing is, so your differentiable function can be non-continuous. Does that make sense? Right. So the idea is that like, if my value is greater than one, my grade, I want to set it the gradient to be like zero. But if it's less than it, I want to make a slope. So that's still differentiable. It's just, it's like if you remember in calculus, like if you have these piecewise functions, you can have a set of two different derivatives based off where the input is. So that's, it's completely fine. Okay. So now let's review what a loss function is. So let's take the example of a linear regression. Um, a line is defined as a y equals mx plus b, where m is slope and b is bias. And what we want to do is we want to minimize the sum of squares given data points. So if you have a bunch of data points, you can fit a line, and you actually can see the distance to every single point. Uh, and we, what we want to do is we actually want to minimize that. So this technique in like linear algebra, if you've taken it, is called least squares. Um, an application of this is actually predicting housing values. So if you are trying to build a function to actually predict the value of a house, you might take in like two features like square foot, square footage of the house, as well as the median income in the neighborhood, and we can actually predict a value that's between zero and infinite dollars. And what we actually want to do is, given the data set of different housing prices, as well as these two input features, what we can do is actually uh, minimize the sum of squares to that. So let's actually see what that looks like. So you have these like housing prices, and then essentially you're fitting a line and just trying to make it best fit. Cool. Um, another one for something that's not regression is something called like uh, a softmax loss. And the idea is that when I'm trying to predict a, for example, an image and see what category it is, it follows like a probability set. So the thing is I can have an image and say, okay, is this a cat or a dog? And the idea here is that we can actually make a distribution that what it is uh, that is distinct. So for example, uh, if you have dog and cat, the probability should always sum up to 100%. All right, is there any questions about loss functions or objectives so far? Yeah, you? Know, or any, yeah, you? Okay, um, like here's, a, here's like a kind of a way to think about it. If I have an IPA image of a, a person and I have three people it could be, what I'm trying to say is given the fact that um, I have this image, what is the probability of it being one of those people? Uh, so yeah, it's essentially just a, it's a um, explicit distribution that, are, that sums up to one. So I guess like what's your question exactly? Yeah. So it gives a probability which uh, basically says that it belongs to a particular class. Okay. So, but uh, softmax function is basically known as uh, is known as a multi-class. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So how it is multi-class logistic That's a that's a good question. So it's like how is softmax multi-class regression, a probability regression? So here's an example. Imagine I have. Uh, a bunch of things I'm predicting for output. And some of the examples are I have a, a dog, Chihuahua, and a Doberman. Like they're different breeds of the dogs. They're not actually distinct. Like you can be a dog and a Doberman. You can be a dog and a Chihuahua. But in a softmax, everything is explicit. The more you are a cat, the less you are a dog. Does that kind of make sense? OK. Oh, yeah. Uh, they don't mean much. They're just like essentially neurons in the network. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was a cool, cool image. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have loss functions that can be either regression or classification. Here are some examples of different loss functions that are good for different tasks. Uh, it's really important to pick the right uh, objective function. Um, so for example, if I'm trying to predict probabilities, like let's say predicting probabilities of something is a cat or a dog. I can technically use a Euclidean loss, which is like the L, you know these uh, sum of squares, um, but that doesn't really make sense because if you think about a probability value, what are the possible values? It's between zero and one. Whereas a Euclidean loss, the regression value can be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it could technically still work, but it won't give you the optimal results what you're looking for. So it's it's really crucial to come up with a good objective function like um, 
that's why, like, you know, if you think about this whole idea of like sentient AIs, it's not really possible because they're optimizing for an objective. So they could be dangerous. Like, for example, if I tell you know an AI to say, hey, you know what, like, eradicate cancer, it could just kill all the humans on the earth, and technically, it did its job, right? So you have to be. That's how it's really crucial to pick your right objective function. So now we have our loss function and a neural network. The next step is um, when we have an error when we're training, how do we know what part of the network is responsible for creating that error? So like in a, the way to think about it is, imagine you have like an assembly line creating like a, like a phone. Um, at the end of the line, if the phone is defected, how do you trace back to where it happened? Um, and kind of you kind of have to go procedurally go, starting backwards. Uh, that's kind of the same idea with neural networks. Like given that fact that we have an error, how do we know where it came from? So I think we can go back to the simple linear regression, and I think it's a good example. So uh, as earlier, we defined a Euclidean loss, or an L2 loss, as this. The loss is simply uh, 0.5, 1 half times uh, y minus y hat squared, where y hat is what we predict, and y is actually uh, the ground truth. So we're essentially saying, OK, given the fact that it was this value, and the network output at this value, we subtract them and square it. It's fairly straightforward. So now we're saying, OK, you know what? Uh, we have this loss value, which we want to make to go to 0, essentially. How do we find out the, how the network, the output of the network, contributed to this loss? What we can actually do is, if you think about in back in calculus, is we can take the gradient, or the derivative, of the, how did this loss uh, get contributed by the output of the network? So if you take the derivative of this, you simply get y hat minus y. OK, and then the next part that's kind of interesting is like, how did the two terms of linear regression, which once again are slope and bias, contribute to the output of the network? Right? So we think about y hat equals mx plus b. How does m contribute to uh, y hat, and how does b contribute to y hat? So we take the derivative of both. And the way that m contributes to y hat is what x, which is the input. And the way that the bias contributes to the output is simply a scalar. Remember the derivative of any constant is just one. Cool. Um, so this part is actually kind of cool. So if we have a bunch of data points, we can actually, just for two variables, actually plot out different slopes and biases that actually can uh, show the error of the whole training set. So right here, given the fact that we have a slope and bias of negative two, we actually get a very high error. Um, so if you look at this, you're like, hey, you know what, I actually can you know, eyeball where that shouldn't be very good. It's like somewhere around here. But you know, when we actually talk about deep neural networks, like the ones that we use at DeepScale, we actually have millions or billions of parameters, and you can't really visualize that. So we have to actually use much more advanced techniques. Cool. Is there any questions so far? OK. Um, so now it's a little bit more. I promised the math was almost over. Um, so before, we calculated uh, how does the output of our network contribute to our loss, and we calculated how the variables contribute to the output. If you remember from calculus, we have something called the chain rule. And the chain rule is essentially um, a fancy way of saying, is that, hey, we can actually compound different gradients to make a gradient of the whole system. And that's exactly what we do here. To get the loss con uh, from the uh, contribution of the slope, we can actually just multiply it. So we get x times the difference. And then to get the loss relative to the bias, it's actually as well as the difference of the two output values. Right? Together, these two derivatives make a gradient. So gradients are just a sequence of derivatives. If you think about it, it's either a vector or a matrix of derivatives. And that's essentially a gradient. Um, and then what we can do is, given the fact that we have this, this gradient or derivative in this loss space, we can actually start taking steps towards the minimum. So once again, if we start up in the top corner here, we can actually, in the top left corner where negative 2, negative 2 are, we can actually start stepping down uh, with the curvature. So think about it like if you had a marble and it's just kind of rolling down. That's kind of what we're trying to do to minimize loss. Cool. And this alpha rate, that, the rate of what we apply, is essentially this, uh, it's called the learning rate. It's just how fast are we learning. If we make it too big, then essentially we're just always bouncing around. If we make it small enough, then we can actually converge to the bottom of the, the essentially the, the lost contour. 
Uh, and here's a cool animation where essentially you're doing this gradient descent uh, by learning. So you randomly initialize your bias and your uh, slope and you actually can learn by iterating over the data set to actually find a good fit for the data set. So it's like the whole idea of starting from the top in the, in the curve somewhere and just taking steps until you reach a part that's completely flat in the lost contour. Cool. Yes? Okay, so what's your learning rate in the not constant? Is it like getting slower at the end? Well, it's getting slower not because the learning rate is changing, but it's getting slower because the, the, it's becoming less steep. Oh, okay. So right here, it's like you're going to have much bigger steps in the red. But then as you get lower and lower, your steps are smaller. Okay. Yes? Um, why doesn't the B change the constant? Because um, the B is a, it, the B doesn't change much because it it's typically learns a lot quicker. So if you think about B, it should typically go to like the mean of your data set. So that's something that's qu quite quickly picked up typically. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think about this way, so imagine that um, Everything in my data set is between the values of uh, 0.5 to 1.5. So very quickly, my B is going to hit 1. And then the, X, the slope parameter is actually going to go between those two. So it's, it's going to learn a little bit quicker than the actual slope. All right, any more questions? Yeah, so the idea of gradient descent, which we just kind of showed, isn't just limited to uh, linear regression. We can actually uh, do this with any uh, parameter in the network. So if we have these massive uh, convolutional neural networks, we can actually do the same technique. And we can actually take the derivative through convolutions as well. It's all differentiable. Um, there's this idea of like abusing the chain rule to actually make this very uh, computationally efficient. So mathematicians get quite annoyed about this, but it works out, like with asterisks. Um, the idea is that instead of saying, okay, here's the loss, I'm gonna compute the derivative to my last layer, and then I'm gonna compute the derivative to n minus one layer, and then n minus two layer. That would require like quadratic computations, but what you can actually do is start with the n and then pr compute the second layer, or the last layer, and then go one at a time and actually reuse the gradients from the previous layer. Um, and then this essentially is like a hybrid of the chain rule as well as uh, essentially dynamic programming. You're saving the results from the back as you go deeper and deeper into the network until you hit the front of the network. Does that kind of make sense? It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So here's like a diagram of that. We can start with Y and then compute the derivative uh, relative to the network's output as well as the weights for that. So that's something that's actually something that's like a little bit of a misnomer in deep learning. You actually compute two gradients every single time when you do deep learning, you actually do two backward passes essentially, uh, but you do them at the same time as you go back. You compute relative to the input or the output of the previous layer as well as the weights for the current layer. So it's actually quite interesting. So when you actually do training um, versus inference, inference is just I'm doing the forward of the network, I'm trying to predict a result from a data point. It actually takes about three times as long because you have to do the inference, compute the gradient to the weight, and then compute the gradient to the activations from the previous layer. Cool. Does this all kind of make sense? Any questions? Cool. So as we talked about, as we talked about it earlier, this mm -hmm. idea of like we can grab a data point, um, we can essentially compute, do the forward pass in our network, and actually compute the loss, and then backprop that or go backwards and actually apply those uh, gradients. Um, and we essentially just repeat this until the, the network stabilizes. This is known as scatastic gradient descent. And this is kind of like the key to optimizing, not just as linear regression, but also most deep neural networks. Um, but there are some more advanced techniques that we can do. But this idea of, can we find the best possible weights to minimize the loss of the network? This whole thing is called optimization. And that's kind of um, what we're trying to do here. So that's actually a fun term, optimization, because it can mean many things. Uh, it can mean like, hey, how do I, once again, reduce the loss get, uh, by uh, better picking the weights of the network? And it can also mean, hey, how do I make this a lot faster? Like, how do I make this run faster? So typically, um, you should be careful how you say optimization, as well as how you say performance. So what does performance mean? Say, oh, my network performs well. Like, those are things you should be careful of saying. 
So here's an example of a trick you can do. Um, before, if you think about the contour of the loss function and how you're trying to go into like the valley of it, uh, it can be quite noisy if you're just picking one sample at a time. It kind of bounces around like a, a ping pong ball. But what you can actually do is you can actually keep a running loss, uh, a running momentum of your network. So what ends up happening is it becomes a lot smoother. The idea, is, the idea here is that um, you kind of apply the same technique of like, let's say you're running in a field and going through some cones. You have momentum in your body, which makes you a lot smoother. You don't move in like a zigzag. You kind of move in more of like a, like a bend. And you can apply the same technique for optimizing parameters in the network, uh, which we do here. So the idea is that if you're before ping-ponging around by essentially adding a term that you use your previous momentum can actually make you go more um, scope into a valley. Uh, and um, we can show a diagram of that. Like, look at this. So as you can see here, uh, some of these kind of get stuck because they're ping-ponging around, like SGD. But these other ones that use momentum parameters can actually go down the saddle point. So these are different optimizers. Like SGD is like the vanilla one that we just talked about, where I just pick a point, apply the update, and repeat. Whereas some other, other of these ones have a little bit more specialized parameters. Like they, for example, have a different learning rate for every parameter of the network. Cool. Is there any questions about optimizers? OK, cool. Yeah. Not necessarily a randomness. It's more about um, they keep running parameters of, in, in the optimizer. So the idea is that, like for example, when you have something like what's momentum or NAG, what you end up having is you keep a running a tally of what previous gradients were applied to this uh, parameter I'm optimizing. Right, so if you keep a running tally on that, you actually get like a smoother gradient. Whereas some of these other ones, like for example, like RMS prop or add a delta or add a grad, what you can actually do is uh, have a different learning rate to every single parameter so they can actually learn differently. So it's like some features can learn more quick and some features can learn slower. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. How do, how, how do some of them know to diverge from this visual path right here? Yeah, so it's actually quite interesting. So I, I implore you to read some of these papers. But one, some of the ideas like, okay, what if I keep the, like the, energy of each gradient. So you can do that by keeping a running tab on the uh, essentially um, RMS of every single gradient. And so you just keep a tally of every gradient and actually use that to adjust how fast you apply it to that gradient. So it's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, but different optimizers, of course, um, can be better for different things. Okay. And there was another one. Yeah. Well, there's two factors, right? There's how you apply the gradient, which is like the magnitude, and that's more of a, some of these like a, uh, a RMS prop, add a delta or grad, and that's more about the magnitude of how you apply the gradient, whereas momentum is something that affects the gradient. It's like adding another term to the gradient when you apply your loss. Very right, cool. All right, um, so now we're moving on to data sets. I think this is probably the hardest part about deep learning, as Forrest said. Um, when it comes to your neural networks, you want to have a diverse data set. So here's like an example. If I'm trying to build a self-driving car and I just have highway data, uh, my car is not going to work very well in the city. And it's something you have to constantly think about. Like, how do I create a diverse, amount, a diverse data set that is transferable to the domain I'm trying to apply it in? Um, so there's different techniques you can do. Data is actually really expensive to gather and uh, annotate. So one thing that people do a lot is you can actually do things to increase the amount of data you have via augmentations um, and resampling. So for example, um, if I'm trying to predict uh, if there's a dog or not, one thing I can do is I can reflect the image. I can add noise to the image. I can add small rotations. And just by doing this, I can increase the amount of data I have of that particular dog. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so collecting your data set, it's quite hard. You would want to create it very diverse. 
have different conditions. Like for example, for self-driving again, you want to have conditions that are not just in sunny weather on the highway in California. You want to have different weathers, uh, different locations, uh, different types of landscapes like highway, city, uh, rural. So you kind of want like a diverse uh, set of points. So we can go over the different, the most common data sets for image classification. The most common one, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, is called MNIST. And this was made in the 90s by the post office for recognizing digits. Um, so typically when you want to just validate that your network works or your machine learning, machine learning model works, you typically start with MNIST. Uh, and it should work immediately. So it's pretty much considered a solved problem and also regarded as the kind of the hello world of uh, machine learning. Um, the next one is called CIFAR. It's about the same, it's about the same size as MNIST, it's about 60,000 images, um, and it has about 10 categories, and it's a little bit step up. So if you're trying to like rapidly develop network models, it's pretty common to actually develop on CIFAR 10 using these categories, uh, rather than the one we're gonna talk about next. So this is called uh, ImageNet, and this is kind of known as like the, beh the behemoth of deep learning tasks. Uh, so this has uh, this task, which is a thousand different categories of just random stuff, um, has about 1.3 million images, so it's quite large. Um, you know, back in the earlier deep learning days, it would take a GPU about two to three weeks to actually train on this. Whereas now, uh, due to innovations in deep learning as well as hardware, you can train the most state-of-the-art model in about 15, 20 minutes. You know, from uh, Forrest and Kurt's former group. It's quite interesting. Um, but one of the things that's actually interesting about ImageNet is it's quite used uh, commonly to actually train on ImageNet first and then transfer it to another task. So if I only have a few thousand images for the thing I'm trying to do, what I can actually do is first train on ImageNet or download one that's pre-trained on the internet because there's a lot and actually uh, transfer learn on the, the task I want to do. The, the images that, um, the features that you typically learn for ImageNet apply very well to a lot of other tasks. So if I'm trying to detect uh, something in the wild from your own data set, it makes a lot of sense to start off with ImageNet features and move forward. But if you're trying to do something like, I want to start with ImageNet features and then do detection on, like, I don't know, electron microscopes of cells, it may not be the best choice. But for something that's in the same domain of like the human realm, it makes a lot of sense. Cool. Is there any questions about these data sets or how they're used? Yeah. That's a good point. You lose the old stuff, right? Yeah, it's some, it's, so it's kind of not like, it's like this, right? When you first start a network, you randomize the parameters. And then you kind of, you kind of iterate to get to a point where you converge. Um, the only difference now is that your starting point is now features that were trained on this. Oh, so you start off where you left off. So like yes. You, yeah, that's what I was like wondering, like, how do you, if yeah. you lose that progress, even if you don't, you just start there. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. So imagine I'm trying to build a detector for your face. Uh, like I, I just want to classify, is this your face or not? What I can do is I can either gather a million images of you, which is quite hard. Um, I don't think that's too possible. But what I can actually do is actually I can get a network that's pre-trained on this and then get, use that as a starting point. I can chop off the last layer and then make a detector for your face and then actually start training at that point. And this can actually reduce your training time by a lot and actually give you a lot better results. Um, for a lot of tasks, especially when you have very sparse data, this can usually increase your accuracy by 20, 30 percent just by training from something else beforehand. Um, so this idea is called transfer learning. It's like, um, it's like if the fact that you have a strong mathematical background in class can help you be better at statistics by learning math beforehand. It's kind of the same idea. Any more questions about the data sets? Cool. Well, actually, just about that transfer learning, I mean, is that built into a lot of the, uh, like, TensorFlow, whatever you're using? Is that pretty standard in the available infrastructure? Yeah, so it's available in every, every framework. Um, so what you do instead, instead of randomizing, uh, this, they call it initialization, right? So you have two options when you start training a network you can either initialize it to something random or start off from a checkpoint. In this case, your checkpoint is simply what was trained on this. 
So it's, it's, it's usually baked in if you're, using, if you're reusing someone's architecture. Um, yeah, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, they, they all support this. Cool. So now we're going to talk about overfitting and underfitting. So this is actually something I find quite interesting. So overfitting is fitting to their training data, but not generalizing. So the analogy I like to think about a lot is from kindergarten, where uh, you know you read books together in class. I'm not sure if you guys did that, but there was a a kid next to me who actually never learned how to read, but just kind of memorized like the story. So in class when we read together, you would just like repeat what the story was. So then my teacher caught on to this and decided one day, hey, let's read backwards, like reading like word by word backwards, and like he just completely tripped up. And so that's an example of overfitting. Like he's overfitting to the story and not actually learning what the words actually were um, by just memorizing the data set or the book. Um, the opposite of that would be something like underfitting, where the model does not capture the tr all the trends in the data. And an example of that is like, instead of learning words, you're learning how to just pronounce words, like the consonants, and how to actually um, say it out loud. So there's a lot of words in English where um, they're like kind of like edge cases, right? Like they, they're pronounced differently, like read and read. Uh, they're spelled the same, but they are said differently. And these are things you just kind of have to pick up. So if you have a model for this, you kind of need to be able to capture some of these edge cases, not just have a very like overly robust model that just kind of like spells everything out when you're pronouncing it. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. Um, so I have a diagram of this. So on this case, if you have this kind of data set, underfitting would be just the, I'm just putting a line right through it. Um, and what happens is that you can generalize the data quite well, but then there's some trends in the data that we don't capture, like for example, this curvature. Uh, overfitting is like, okay, I wanna just fit the best model for my training set. So it makes the loss quite good when you're overfitting to this one on the right, but when you actually try to deploy it in the wild or try to use it on data that you haven't trained on, it actually does really poor. So then this idea of that you don't wanna be underfitted or overfitted, you wanna be balanced. So this idea is that we can capture some of the trends in the data, but not capturing too much of just one uh, single edge cases. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes you reduce your training data to influence your architecture, right? Yeah. So I mean, how, how do you, uh, is that a good way to go about that? If, I mean, what you're really looking for is... That's a good question. So that's my next slide. Um, so one of the things we can do is actually split up our data set. So the thing is, if we just optimize um, to reduce our like the loss in our training set, there's an algorithm for that, right? It's called k-nearest neighbors. What we do is just we have a big data set, like a big hat, like a lookup table, and we just look up what that thing is. But anything that's outside of that will do quite poor. Um, so what we can actually do to actually make good models that we can actually use in the wild, we can actually do a methodology for our, our, our data set. So we get our data set and we split it into three disjoint parts, so no overlap, usually in semi condi different conditions. So we can have a training set, a validation set, and a test set. Uh, when we're training, we learn the training set, but when we, uh, at the end of every, you know, n or so iterations, which we call an epoch, we can actually evaluate it on the validation set, saying, okay, I'm training on this, but how well am I generalizing? And that's something you should keep track of. And then what you can do is, during this training stage of tweaking the architecture, changing things, you should actually be doing things to increase your accuracy on the validation set. And when you're done all of this, then what you do is evaluate on a test set. So for most of these data sets we talked about, ImageNet, uh, like not MNS, but ImageNet or most of these challenges that you do, they actually don't release the test sets annotations, but just release the data. So what you end up doing is when you want to submit for a leaderboard, you evaluate on the data they have for the test and then set, email them a file or something. And then they actually run it themselves and actually put you on the leaderboard. So you don't have access to it, but you have access to the validation set. So yeah, you optimize for the validation set and then finally evaluate and test that. Cool, is there any questions about this? This process about uh, building training models? All right, cool. So I can show you what it looks like. Um, if this is accuracy, so higher is better. Um, our training accuracy is usually going to be always increasing to the capacity of the network. Um, if we have a good model, what we're going to see is that the validation accuracy, this green line, is going to follow. So as our network is learning better on the training set, 
the validations that accuracy is going up. That's, that's a good model. But if we're going up in training accuracy and we actually hit a plateau and start going down, that means we're overfitting. That's this blue line. So an example is the green line is someone just kind of sounding out every word, uh, but learning the edge cases of English, whereas blue is just kind of memorizing the words if we go back to the former analogy. Is there any questions about overfitting? Okay, cool. So how do we combat overfitting? We can get more data. Like if we just increase our data size, we can actually combat overfitting just by having more samples. It's like having more examples when you're doing your math homework. It kind of just helps you learn better. You can do data augmentation, like how we talked about. If we're learning a data set full of dogs and cats, we can just flip them, we can rotate them a little bit, we can add some noise, and this augments our data set to be a lot larger. Uh, we can regularize. Uh, this is a fun term, but what we can do is we can actually make the network not learn as much by punishing it for having high confidences in certain weights. So this idea of that we can actually com compute the normal, like a, a normalization term, so aka the absolute value of some of these weights, and actually add that to the loss. So if uh, a certain feature is super uh, aggressive, we can actually make it go more towards zero. And by doing this, you can actually make the network more robust by making more features uh, smaller magnitudes throughout the network. Um, another thing you can do is ignore some of the weights. So it's like, hey, I think these parameters are causing the loss to be high. You can kind of just drop it and not apply it. And so there's a term called dropout where you can do this, where you just don't apply half of the weights randomly. And over time, this can make your network more robust. And finally, if you're overfitting, one thing you might do that's just a lot easier is just use a simpler model that's more robust. So if you don't have a more complex model, then you can't overfit, right? Cool. Now we're gonna talk about underfitting. Um, so here's like a, a good diagram of uh, underfitting. So if you're, so in this case, loss, lower is better. <laughs> so it's a little confusing, but lower is better. So the thing is, if our training loss is always going down and our validation loss is always following that, what that means is that um, there's not really a point where we're overfitting. So the thing is, for most of these models or when you're training on data sets, you want to get to a point where you start overfitting because you know you reach the capacity of your network for learning uh, to adapt to this domain. But if you're always just kind of like hovering over each other, what that means is that you can probably go for a more complex model that covers more edge cases. So yeah, here are your kind of things you can do. You can actually use a more complex model or you could turn down this regularization that you're using. Is there any questions about, about this? So here are the takeaways. Neural networks are function approximators. Deep learning works surprisingly well. Optimizing networks is kind of like a dark art that requires intuition. Making good data sets is very hard. Um, overfitting makes it hard to generalize for applications. And uh, we can find out how robust our models are by doing validation testing. And that's the end. Uh, what are the questions? about, I don't know, projects you're doing or about the talk or anything, or about deep scale, you can answer them. Yeah. Um, so with deep neural nets, is there kind of a, okay, so like with the same old traditional matrix factorization techniques, for example, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question here is, is there essentially a way to kind of open the black box and actually see what the features are uh, relating to in a, a deep neural network? And um, there is to some, some degree. Um, one of the things you can do is you can visually inspect features in the network. So given certain layers, you can actually visually inspect what the layers, uh, what the activations or the output of each layer looks like. And so if you see something where it's just all zero or all like high values, then I can tell you some, um, some uh, information. Or uh, a more common approach is you can actually use networks to actually learn 
these essentially components. So that's a, there's an entire area of autoencoders where what I can do is I can get some input and actually output that same input, but have some very tight bottleneck somewhere in the middle of the network. And this tight bottleneck can actually represent some principal components of what the network is actually learning. Does that kind of make sense? Like an example is imagine I have a thousand uh, dimensional input and I'm learning that thousand dimensional output. And in the middle of the network, I have something that's like five dimensions. What I can actually do is look at those five dimensions and actually maybe plot that and see how it's relating those things or cluster those uh, principal components. Cool. Any more questions? Um, it's not quite built in, but if you think about if you have a full neural network and if you just chop off half of it, you kind of get those intermediate features just by not evaluating the other half. Yeah, I mean, is there a term for it for us? Do you, remember, do you know? Not sure. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if there's an exact term for it. All right, cool. Thank you.